just start. Are there any ministers over here in this section that would like to introduce themselves? Cletus and Marion, amen. Amen. Stand up and say who you are, what you're at, what you're doing. I got you. <laughs> Man. Middle section right here. Don Lloyd. Don, go ahead and stand up and introduce yourself. My family. Man. Henry? You want to stand and introduce yourself? <laughs> Anybody that wants to soak, amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Anybody else in the middle section that would like to introduce themselves? We're grateful that you came out tonight. Anybody over here in this section here? Amen. And we have Marlene and Larry with us, and Marlene is pastor at uh, Man for Life, one of the pastors there, and uh, we're delighted there. Amen. And Nikki, praise the Lord, from... Uh, Nick, I know, Nikita, and uh, <laughs> Nikita from Oshkosh, my gosh, yeah, the church, yeah, amen, and uh, her mom and dad are Joe and Sean Butler that pastor Bethel Worship Center, <laughs> I knew that too, yeah, uh, let's turn our Bibles open, I just want to share a verse of scripture with you tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13, um, you know, when we think about evangelists traveling ministries, you know, we want to bless them abundantly because there are so few in the land that are so true <laughs> and doing such good works, amen? And the ones that uh, are true and faithful to God, we want to just keep them on the road with our tithe, with our offering, actually, amen? The tithe goes to the local church, but... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13, it says, Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple? And they that wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. And so, even so, the Lord has ordained that they which preach the gospel should live by the gospel. Amen? And so what that means is, is that when we give of our offering tonight, that uh, Dr. Gary is going to be able to continue to minister to many other people. At some places, he may receive more. At other places, he may receive less. But he has to be there in that location to be a blessing to them so that in a, in a while, they may be able to do more. Amen? And be a blessing to somebody else. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 11, it says that Paul actually said, I've come, I'm coming to impart some spiritual gift to you. And if, they, if Dr. Gary is imparting some spiritual gift to us, then it's just a wonderful thing that we can give of our natural substance. Isn't that true? And so it just makes sense. And uh, so he's going to impart things that an evangelist carries with him. It's a beautiful, wonderful way that God has created the body to help each other. And so we are so blessed that he has come to be with us, and uh, we just want to pray over the offering. We're going to receive that right now, and then we're going to turn him loose. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give into the work of the Lord. Father, we pray that right now that you'll just receive this offering, bless it, multiply it, take care of Dr. Gary, his family, uh, his wife, his children, grandchildren. Father, we just pray that every need will be met whatever it is, spiritual, emotional, physical. And Father, we just thank you for the many, many lives that are going to be changed because of this great ministry. And we are grateful that you have sent him here in Jesus' name. Amen. You can make your checks out to CFC. If you don't know how much to make it out for, just sign the check, put it in the offering. Our ushers are trained to take care of the rest. 
Amen. If you don't have money, maybe you can borrow a thousand dollar bill from your neighbor. You'll pay him back in the millennium. Praise the Lord. Let's welcome Dr. Gary Wood. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am so excited to be here with you tonight. I'm a man on a mission with a message to make heaven real to this generation. And when you leave here tonight, I pray that you will be prepared to spend all eternity there. I bring you greetings from my good friend, uh, Dr. Joe Lamb, who just recently ministered here. And uh, so glad to see uh, Ben and his lovely family again, and excited that they're part of this thriving ministry. And uh, I was talking to uh, Brother Joel in the hotel a few moments ago, and I said, hey, Doc, can you tell me uh, something that would maybe cut the ice with the people at the church? And that I could say, you know, that would uh, maybe gain me some favor. And uh, there was a, a pause. And uh, Joe said, yeah, don't mess up. <laughs> and so with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to take that advice. But I want to invite you, if you can, to be in every service. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing my exciting testimony as to how Jesus raised me from the dead and has prepared for us all a beautiful place that he wants us to spend eternity with him. And uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to be sharing about how to receive a double portion of the anointing of God. How many of you want more of God in your life? Amen. How many of you like to have a double portion? I'm going to preach... Uh, uh, illustrated message tomorrow night and I promise you you will never forget and I'm going to show you vividly and scripturally uh, what the mantle was that Elijah dropped and Elisha picked up and we're going to have an impartation service tomorrow night for everyone that will come because Jesus wants us to do the greater works. Can I say, have an amen? amen. And uh, every service is going to be a special service. In the morning, Pastor, aren't we going to be meeting with the men? Yes. And uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, men, I'm going to be sharing a special word that God has given me to share with you. Thank you so much for coming out in this freezing cold weather. <laughs> now, I know it's probably mild for most of you here in Green Bay, but it's cold for this Texas boy. And let me just say right up front, I forgive you for humiliating us. <laughs> We're not in the same league as the Green Bay Packers, but we are progressing. We're progressing. And, uh, we just love to be here. So excited about what God is going to do in these services. Well, I pray you brought the word of God with you. If you did, lift it up, wave it, make the devil real mad. If you didn't, lift one hand up in the air, put one hand up over your heart and say this with me, if you will. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm so honored to be here tonight where the word of God is given preeminence and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is, allowed freedom to move. is allowed freedom to move. The situation I am in, situation I am in is, subject is subject to change. Jesus Christ is here tonight, is here tonight to, meet to meet my physical, spiritual, spiritual and, financial and financial needs. He is my shepherd. Is my shepherd. I shall not want. He restores my soul. Whom the sun sets free is really free. So I choose to be free from sin, sickness, 
disease, disease, sorrow, sorrow, grief, grief, and poverty. poverty. Jesus Jesus bore them for me. So I choose not to bear them any longer. I choose to walk in the glorious freedom that Jesus Christ died to provide for me. I will never, never be the same again after hearing this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse one as we take a tour to a place called heaven. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. This is a direct command from God Almighty that we are to set our hearts and minds upon heaven. One translation I love says simply, keep seeking heaven. The most dependent thought that can ever occupy the mind of man is heaven and how to get there. And thank God he hasn't left us to grope in darkness, but he's given us his word as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The human heart longs for the blessed immortal assurance that one day we're going to live with God forever in a place that's free of sin, sickness, and disease. I've got good news for you tonight. Jesus Christ has been preparing for us such a place and he's promised personally to return and take us to live with him there throughout all eternity. Just prior to leaving the earth, he gathered his disciples together in an upper room in Jerusalem and left them this comforting message found in John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you at where I am there you may be also. The literal Greek says, doubt not that there's for all of you a place in my father's house, for I'm going on purpose to prepare it. When God created each and every one of us, he created us as eternal beings. Man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11 says, that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. That's why the things of this earth are never going to fully and permanently satisfy you. One day the Bible says you're going to die. It's appointed a man once to die and after that the judgment. Outside of the rapture of the church, death is a certainty. Proverbs 23, 18 says, surely there is a hereafter. Kings die, queens die, presidents die, sports figures, the rich and the powerful, the poor and the illiterate, buried in the same ground, lying side by side, because whether you want to admit it or not, you're a very mortal creature, and you're just one heartbeat away from eternity. And outside of the rapture of the church, you'll have an appointment with death. And the Bible teaches, according to Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, that your body will return to the dust of the earth from which it came, and your spirit will return to God. Now, if you're a believer, if you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then the Bible teaches, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Death for a Christian is not a tragedy. It's a celebration. It's a transference from this temporary life to everlasting eternal life. And angels, according to the book of Isaiah, 
will take you as a believer and they'll carry you underneath their wings and they'll bring you right into the presence of the Lord. On the other end of the spectrum is something more horrific than any Hollywood script could ever conjure up. The Bible teaches there's a real literal place called hell. Now, I know we don't hear much preaching about it today, but Jesus spoke more about hell than he spoke about heaven. There are 244 signposts in the New Testament warning against going there. It's a place of eternal separation from God. It's a place where you will fall and fall and fall, but you will never land. It's a place where you will burn and burn and burn, but you'll never be consumed. It's a place, the Bible says, of perpetual eternal darkness and separation from God, who is light. It's a place where worms will crawl throughout the crevices of your body. It's a place, the Bible teaches, that you'll have a memory. You'll remember this sermon if you wind up there. You'll remember every sermon where you had had an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, but you put it off. And you put it off for the temporary pleasures of this world. And that's why Jesus warned us with this urgent message in Matthew 16, 26. What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. Something inside each and every one of you in this auditorium tonight tells you that there's something bigger, there's something greater than the few mere 60, 70, possibly 80 years that you might be allowed to live upon this earth. Centuries ago, a man by the name of Job asked a very probing question. He said, if a man die, shall he live again? If a man die, shall he live again? People want to know the answer to that question. What happens when I draw my last breath on this earth? Do I just lapse into a state of unconsciousness? Do I go to sleep into a temporary place that some teach until there's a better life? Is there a better life than this life? Is there a real literal place called heaven? What's going on there? Well, I know my loved ones who have departed and gone on before. First Peter chapter two says, friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. But most important, how can you be sure that you're going to go? Well, I want to answer all of those questions and many others as I take you to a place where I've personally been and a place where my heart's desires every one of you will be prepared to go. For nothing is worth being separated from God throughout all eternity. Who in the world in their right mind would choose the destiny to go to a place called hell when you have the opportunity to spend eternity in this beautiful place called heaven. And I want you to be prepared to go there. I was born on March the 1st, 1949 in Dallas, Texas, under the name Gary Lynn Dobbins. At a very early age, my parents proved they did not want the responsibility of raising my little sister and I. And they took us and put us on the front steps of a porch of a family by the name of Wood. Both of our parents were alcoholics. Uh, my father was a child abuser. He would take cigarettes in his drunken stupor and extinguish them between my legs. I still currently bear those marks upon my body. In today's society, I'm sure my natural father would have been arrested and in prison for his transactions. My mother was a practicing prostitute and they abandoned us. And this family by the name of Wood took us in and they went through the legal process 
in the state of Texas, the capital being Austin, to adopt us into their family, thereby granting unto us all the rights and privileges of one bearing the family name. I can easily identify with the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 8, verse 15, where he says, we haven't received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but whether we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The word adoption means being placed as a son into a family with all the rights and privileges of one bearing the family name. The word Abba, Father, is very intimate in the Greek. It means Papa, Papa, or Daddy, Daddy. In this new environment, my little sister was adopted along with me and all of our needs were met. Our name was legally changed to wood and many of our heart's desires were granted unto us. <coughs> we were taken on a regular basis to the Hillcrest Southern Baptist Church where I heard a very simple message proclaimed. The preacher said, all have sinned, all have come short of the glory of God. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in very childlike simplicity, I went forward and received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I grew up in this wonderful, loving environment. And then because of economic reasons, my family had to move from Dallas, Texas, where I was born, to a town called Farmington, New Mexico, that borders on the four corners of Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. My father actually, with a group of construction personnel, built and constructed what is now known as the Four Corners Monument. And my father actually constructed uh, Farmington, and he built the high school that I graduated from, and I assisted him. I say this very humbly, but I only say it to emphasize the tremendous miracle of which I'm about to share with you. For three years in a row, God endowed me with a talent of which I was honored to win number one in all state solo competition. With that, I received a scholarship of which I chose to apply to Wayland Baptist University in Plainview, Texas. I went the first semester. I was returning home. It was December 23rd, 1966. My cousin called me on the phone in the evening, said, hey, bro, we're going to have a party tonight of all the high school kids. We're going to have a reunion. And he said, uh, bring Sue and come over and we'll just have a good time. I took my little sister and we went over to the party. There was no drinking. There was no drugs. It was just good, clean fun and a good reunion from high school classmates. The party broke up about 10, 20, 10, 25. And my little sister and I started home that evening. December 23rd, 1966, snow was falling, Christmas was in the air, you could see the lights decorating the houses, the atmosphere was exciting, my little sister had a beautiful melodious soprano voice, I loved to hear her sing, and she began to sing Silent Night, Holy Night, and I was thinking about spending Christmas with the family and what would I get for a present, and uh, Suddenly, <clears throat> she let out a blood-curdling scream. I turned, looked, saw horror etched across her face. What happened next was to transform my life. I later learned, because Farmington was in the midst of a big oil field boom, there was a truck illegally parked on the edge of the highway, and it was saturated in oil. My little sister saw it, but it was too late. She screamed to warn me as the lights reflected off the bumper. It was just like running into a brick wall. Now I was driving my dad's Oldsmobile station wagon. They don't make cars like that anymore. It's like a tank 
and uh, it squashed that car like an accordion. First thing I felt was an explosion in my face, sharp searing pain along my lower facial extremities, and then I was free of all pain. Dying is simply like taking your clothes off, discarding and laying them down. I just stepped out of my body. I rose above the top of the car. My whole life passed before my eyes. You can uh, purchase my uh, testimony in the back, and there's a story in there which I explain eternity. I'm now entered into God's realm of time. Time as I knew it ceased to exist. I was caught up in a swirling, massive, funnel-shaped cloud. A light, very bright, but not blinding, consumed me. Angels came and they lifted me up under their wings. They began to take me upward, upward, upward. Being a music major, I heard the most beautiful music I've ever heard. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and power. Wisdom and dominion be given unto thee forever, O Lord. Amen and amen. And I want to commend your worship and praise team. They did an excellent job tonight. In fact, I want to tell you, sang every one of my favorite songs. I loved it tonight. What a wonderful atmosphere. But you've never heard anything till you've heard a maraud of the heavenly chorus singing the hallelujah chorus. The angels, as they sang the hallelujah chorus, escorting me right into the presence of God. I came to the bottom of a beautiful green grassy hill. In this transaction from death to eternity, the first thing you notice is you retain all of your five physical senses. You move very swiftly. I came to the bottom of beautiful green grassy hill. Heaven is located towards the north. <coughs> I am healed in Jesus' name. I've been going through, a, through uh, different time zones and from 80 degree temperature to minus zero. And so uh, you do see a few symptoms, but they will not prolong. My body is healed in Jesus' name. And uh, heaven is located. The Bible teaches towards the north. God hung it upon the empty space because there was nothing that could sustain this massive, wonderful structure. As I looked up, I saw a gigantic golden city suspended in space. It's in the form of a perfect cube. It had 12 foundations with the names of the 12 apostles inscribed upon them. Saw 12 gates of pearl. Those gates of pearl, ladies and gentlemen, young people, are over 500 miles in width. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written upon them. Many years ago, I gave this story in Florida in front of a NASA scientist who helped put the first man on the moon. He came to me and he said, son, I wanna give you a tidbit of information. He said, we've done some research scientifically and here's what we've calculated heaven's dimensions as being recorded according to the Bible. It's over 2,250,000 square miles at its base of perimeter. It's 780,000 stories high and there's enough room to comfortably accommodate 100 billion people. That's more people than have ever lived on planet Earth at any one time. It's a real, literal, secure, permanent place. It's an eternal city. I looked upon this giant, beautiful structure created by the hand of Almighty God. I saw the different stories. The first foundation is pure, solid jasper. The stories are the exact foundations that are found in the high priest's breastplate recorded in Exodus chapter 28, verses 15 through 21. Immediately when I was in the store and saw this ring, I purchased it. 
because it's exact replica of what I was witnessing. The very first foundation is solid jasper, which stands for diamonds and the glory of God. Now think about it, ladies. One day you're not going to be wearing earring, tennis bracelet, anklet, diamond ring. You're going to be walking on it, sweetheart. Walking on it. And uh, men, here's the kicker. We don't have to foot the bill. <laughs> Somebody ought to rejoice. Hallelujah. And all my life as a kid growing up in church, I heard the old preacher say, heaven streets are paved with gold. Wrong. They are not paved with gold. They are goat. They are pure, solid goat. But the gold is transparent. And there's an impurity in goat. And once that impurity is removed, gold becomes crystal clear. Now, if you don't believe that, you can go to a, to a jeweler. I mean, a real nice jeweler in a mall that sells Rolex watches. And uh, you can verify what I just said. Now, that's what I, that's what I was looking at. The grass is, is beautiful. It's as lush as this beautiful carpet upon which I'm standing. But there were diamonds glistening all over it. I began to walk upwards, and the grass and the diamonds came all the way through my feet. Yet there were no indentions where I had just previously stepped. I looked up and saw an angel. Every angel I saw in heaven was anywhere from 40 to 70 feet tall. I just gave you the dimensions of the walls of the city. <coughs> so imagine this angel. Beautiful gold spun hair. Drawn sword. Golden belt. Adorned in his waist. And he had a, a book in his hand. Inside the city gate was, was uh, another angel. There are 12 gates representing 12 areas that you can come in from and enter from, from all over, north, south, east, and west. And uh, these two angels said something. There was some kind of uh, communication between them. And then I was granted access into the city of Jerusalem into this place called heaven. Now the Bible teaches the moment you're born, and remember this because I'll close with this. The moment you are born in this earth, your name is recorded in a set of what the Bible calls the books. Every thought, every deed, every intent that you do up until the moment you are born again is written down in what the Bible calls the books. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, your name is transferred out of the books. All that's transpired up to that time is eradicated. It's wiped out. And your name is written then in the Lamb's book of life. I remember because I'd received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, I was granted access into the city. I walked down the corridor and went a little distance. There I met my best friend in high school who had died in a previous automobile accident, and I immediately recognized him, which answers in my mind, well, we know one another in heaven. Absolutely. Matthew 8, 11, sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How in the world are you going to sit down with them if you don't know who they are? How would you like to go to a seminar and hear Moses explain about the parting of the Red Sea? How would you like to go to a teaching where Daniel's the instructor and he talks about how God shut the mouths of the lions? And talk about music. Man, we've had awesome music tonight. But whatever flavor, all God's singers are there. What a wonderful atmosphere it's going to be. You'll be reunited with loved ones who've gone on before. So I, I immediately recognized my friend, knew him instantly. We embraced one another. I've incorporated this now into my testimony because I get asked this question so often. 
People will come to me after a service and they'll say, well, what about my loved one that I'm not sure if they made heaven or not? Or I know absolutely that they never did receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior here upon this earth. What about them? Well, I, I, I long over them. Well, I'll be sad over their absence in heaven. Well, there are at least three scriptures. I'm only going to give you one. Psalm 9, 6. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. And so here's what it means. It means that when you get to heaven, it'll just be as though they never existed. And so you'll have no recollection whatsoever. But that ought to motivate us. That ought to stir us to our very core. To be sure that everyone's prepared to go there. My friend then took me into a giant library. I saw all kinds of books there. <coughs> books of prayer requests, spiritual growth in the Lord. The record of souls that we've won to the Lord Jesus Christ. I saw what happened when someone received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Like I just explained, all their sins are eradicated. I saw an angel and he would take a cloth and just wipe away all the transaction from what the Bible calls the books. Then I saw the name inscribed and written into the Lamb's Book of Life. My friend took me, turned the pages, and I saw my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And it said, paid in full by the precious red blood of Jesus. I had a right to be there. I, I saw what happens when people receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, as is going to happen here, even in this service tonight. In heaven, there were like bleachers. That's the only way I know how to describe it, like at a, a sporting activity event. And I saw people sitting there, and they'd occasionally go over, and they'd look down. Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 talks about it. This great host, heavenly host of people who've gone on before us. 